So uh, for those of you who don't know, I, I, don't, I don't use any slides. So it's going to be me and the board here. And so um, I, I write about this big, about like that, like that. And I actually will write smaller than that uh, if I get excited. And I will probably get excited. So all of you guys sitting in back, which is mostly everybody, uh, may be upset by the end of this. Um, so who am I? Uh, I'm Jim Benson. Got my start uh, professionally in psychology. And uh, moved on to, thank you, <laughs> uh, moved on to uh, urban planning. So I built very big things like subway systems and freeways and light rail and whatnot. Um, and during that time, uh, I was always the guy who knew something about computers. Um, and so it was an easy transition for me over time to move from that type of planning to building um, what we call the ITS or Intelligent Transportation Systems uh, for, for government. And while I was doing that, uh, I was getting increasingly frustrated with government as a client and uh, started a software company uh, in 99 or 2000 um, to build software for government. And that was entirely agile. And after doing that for a while, um, we started to see some cracks in the agile framework and uh, moved into lean systems uh, as we started to discover those. So that was like 2004, 2005, 2006 range. And here we are today. Uh, so um, as Olaf mentioned, uh, Tony Ann, who's sitting down here, and I wrote a book called Personal Kanban. Uh, so my psychology background uh, leads me to view things from the person standpoint and not the organizational standpoint. So it's been wonderful over the time that I've known David uh, that we've been able to kind of march the Kanban idea forward both on the personal side and on the organizational side and all of the things in between. Uh, I'll also talk a lot today about cognitive biases and we have another smaller ebook uh, called Why Plans Fail uh, that talks about that. But today, for now, um, and how many people think that they're here to see me for an hour? Okay, how many of you think you're here to see me for two hours? It's like somebody's got to raise their hand at some point. Because uh, it's actually, we don't even know. <laughs> so if you're here to see, if everybody's here to see me for two hours, I could slow down. But if you're here to see me for an hour, I have to talk really quickly. Um, so I'll tell you what. We'll see how far we get through in this in an hour, but I guarantee you there'll be stuff left over. So collaboration. Uh, collaboration's been really important to me through all of my career, uh, and it's what I've always focused on. So when I was building light rail systems and so forth, the government needed to work with the neighborhoods, which needed to work with the engineers, which needed to work with the businesses and so forth, getting people who are entrenched and do not want to work together to actually work together and uh, achieve a product that is acceptable to everybody. So we think that it's hard to build software for people who might actually want to buy it. Uh, try driving a freeway through the middle of somebody's neighborhood and getting them to, to like that. Um, so right now, we want to collaborate because our businesses require it, and they require it more than they've ever required it before. The speed of business, the changes in the market, product life cycles are incredibly short. So before you would launch a product and it would stay out there for decades, and now you launch a, project, a product and people get mad if you don't come out with a new one the next year, even if it's something as durable as a phone. You know, the iPhone seems to come out pretty much every 25 minutes, and then either seven minutes before that or seven minutes after that, the Samsung will come out, and they're, they're in this kind of arms race for who can cause people to fill landfills with cell phones the fastest. Um, and that's part of because we are in an, in a, an increasingly global economy with an increasingly decreasing cost of production. So Tony Ann and I have our books. 
right? And uh, we went out and asked publishers, hey, uh, would you like to publish our book? And they said, yes. And I said, we will give you one dollar a book. And we said, well, what will you do for us? And they said, what? <laughs> you want us to do something? We don't understand. We're publishers. We, we own you. We own content. And we will not, we will, we'd have absolutely no idea why you would want us to actually do something. So we said, well, we'll just start our own publishing company. And we did. And that was all the work that was really required. <laughs> uh, because there right now are multiple, uh, I've got a little bit of a head cold, so I'll apologize ahead of, ahead of time for that. Um, there are multiple companies out there right now who will take your fully formatted book and they will publish it on demand in a very professional way. We have Amazon and other online bookstores that will handle all of the, the distribution, all of the point of sale and stuff, and all we get is money. So the content was all we needed to launch that product. Whereas before, it was really hard to do that. So now, your customers, your, your competitors, at any time, they can become one of whatever you are. Uh, we are incredibly fungible at the moment. Other products, other people can come in and unseat us at any time. Now, we're not, uh, right now, we're not really in danger of destroying O'Reilly Press at Modus Cooperandi Press, but we didn't need their services anymore to get done what we needed to do. So, we'll talk a little bit about the lean startup world. And, their big thing is, you know, test my assumptions, validate my hypothesis, validate my assumptions, validate me. And you can't do that by yourself. You need some collaborative interchange in order to actually validate an assumption. So you come up with an idea, you come up with an assumption, and in order to validate it, you actually have to expose it to something, be it a market or a focus group or your peers. And this is important while we're working because the assumptions that we're validating are across the board. So we have about a million assumptions that we make a minute. So right now, everybody's you know, sitting comfortably in their little white chairs, and you are focusing on me, and you are not at all worried about all of the other white chairs, right? You're not worried about the ceiling. You're not worried about the walls. You're not worried about behind, what's behind you, OK? But if I were to tell you that I took a big, rabid rat and taped it underneath one of the chairs, all of a sudden you'd be paying attention to all of the chairs, like trying to figure out where the rat was. So what our brains do is our brains take in what we think is the relevant and important information, and we build a plausible story about what our surroundings are, and then we act on that assumption. We act on that set of assumptions, right? Where this comes into play in work is that we are constantly assuming that we produce work in a certain way. We're assuming that our coworkers are doing certain things. We're assuming that the client is thinking a certain way when they get the work back. We're assuming that, that we're assuming all of this stuff, all of this social stuff, all of this political stuff, all of this personal stuff, all of this functional stuff. Tons and tons and tons of assumptions. We are building in our individual heads a plausible story of the nature of our project. Right? The problem is 30 to 40 percent of that is just total bullshit. We actually don't know what we're doing. We don't know what our coworkers are doing. We really don't know anything beyond, you know. Uh, a certain amount of a certain amount of stuff. So, this brings us to the wonderful Kanban tool thing. So, let's say that we have our team here, and our team has its Kanban, and um, uh, do and done. Uh, and verify. 
do and done, and then ship. These pieces of paper are always just slightly too thin. So we have just a normal, everyday, ordinary Kanban like this. And it's just sitting there, and it's plugging away, and it's working. It's doing its kanban -y thing. Um, we've errant little thing. Yeah. So we have a bunch of stuff here that's coming up. As this says over here, options, as David was mentioning, options of things that we can choose to pull or discard as we move along. We have things that are actively in production. We have things that are waiting in queue to move along. We have things in the next queue that are working, and then we have some things over here in, in ship. That's awesome. But what we also have here is we have the beginnings of a shared reality, right? So we have to agree on a few things um, for this to work. And I'm not going to pull that yet. So I'm going to go back and talk about this a little bit. So, so we've got a big handful of assumptions here. The first assumption is that we actually know what our value stream is. And any time I work with any team to do their initial value stream mapping, there's several people in the room who will say, you know, this is really simple. I don't know why you just can't write it down and we can be done with it. But it's never that simple because everybody in the room has a slightly different idea of how the team works. So you'll map something out, and you'll have the steps that everything flows through, and everybody says, yeah, that, that's the way it works. And then I'll kind of do a moment of silence, or I'll just stand there and stare at the room. And after a few seconds, somebody says, well, you know, that's not what always happens. And then you start noting exceptions. You start noticing times where there's churn here, or things will flow back like this routinely, even though there aren't defects, because there's some multi-pass process that's going on. Um, people will say, well, things flow like this, except sometime when we get to this step, we have to hand it to an outside resource, and they take a lot of time, and then we have a long conversation about that. Um, and, but the really fun ones are where two people who sit next to each other say, well, I take the work and then I hand it to her, and she does this, and then she says, no, I don't. <laughs> and that happens all the time. So our value streams, our work item types, our WIP limits, all of these things are assumptions. And one of the reasons that we're able to engage in continuous improvement is because as we move along, we refine our knowledge of these assumptions. So that's why our, that's why our boards change. That's why we don't go out and get our boards printed, you know, on big sheets of glass that can never be changed. Uh, we, you know, that's why, that's why we want to remain flexible. It's continuous improvement demands it. So now we want to start using the Kanban to test our assumptions. We want to build this initial value stream, start running work through the value stream, do, 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 do. kind of like this. You know how it works. And as you do that, you start to see the actual nature of the work. You see how the work flows. You see who's doing what. You see who is doing a good job and who can use some help. You see areas or avenues for training and all of those things. So when David put up his ticket, um, I tossed it in there somewhere at the bottom here. Um, there it is, David's labor pool flexibility slide. Um, so David was showing like leaders doing certain things and people who were training under the leaders and they were cycling up and down the board. Then you had the little bowling pin people. Um, who were bouncing back and forth dynamically between things. All of those are collaborative acts. Those are willful collaborative acts, actually understanding how the team can work and how they can communicate with each other. So one of the things that I've liked about this 
Kanban revolution as opposed to what we were doing earlier in Agile is that what we're doing now is extremely outward facing. So uh, Agile was very inward facing. It was, you know, we're going to protect the team, we're going to get this work done, and it was, it was necessary for a time to do that. But what I like about these systems is that this is just generic. We can apply that to other knowledge workers. And in uh, Paris, uh, Derek and Megan Wade gave a presentation about Megan's group, and she works in academia. And this was a group of support people working specifically for, for academics. And initially, when they put up their boards, they put up boards and they would put up tickets that would have just codes on them because they didn't want anybody else to see what they were doing because they were afraid once people, other people saw what they were doing, they would understand that, you know, as Megan said, I was scared to death that people would see how far behind I was. But after putting the board up, it didn't take very long for them all to recognize that they were all that far behind. And that previously they were all harboring this guilt, saying, I'm, I suck because I'm so far behind. And none of them could help each other out because nobody knew what anybody else was doing and all they could think of was, I'm behind, I have to keep working harder. I have to stay late, I have to do this, I have to do that. So she said that as her team went along, her team was looking for more and more opportunities to A, lower their whip, B, cut the number of projects that they had going at any time, a particular time, further lowering their whip, and C, they were looking for more collaborative projects to start. Because once they started using the board, they noticed that collaborative tickets moved more quickly and didn't cause as much rework as non-collaborative tickets. And they did this entirely, I guess you might say organically. It was all fostered by the board. So, let's keep those there. The Kanban becomes three things pretty quickly. One is it becomes a communications hub. And, and we all know this, right? So since the board is sitting here and it is a visual radiator, it's, it's sitting here and giving us information all of the time, the board becomes a logical place for people to go and have conversations. So in a, and that's, conversations are collaborative, right? So you go to the board and you say, huh, you know, this one's been here a while. Why do you think that's been here a while? Or, um, hey, we've, we've pulled uh, this ticket, and the board currently looks like this. Um, what do you guys think that we should pull next? And have, have an actual conversation about it. And pull that, and say, especially say, you know, we can, we, we've got two things here ready to go on. We can only pull one thing in, and there's three of us. You know, what is it that we can pull in from here that we can all work on together and, and knock this thing out? Um, the Kanban, as I mentioned a second ago, is also a laboratory. So you can start saying, how can we change our flow? How can we change our work item types? How can we change the way that we all work together to make work flow more efficiently? And since we can actually measure that, since we can actually see that, then we can test it. We can actually verify the results. So we make an assumption in uh, lean startup uh, parlance, or we have an hypothesis, and we go off and we test that. And then the last bit is that that creates a learning center. We see the flow, we test the flow, we have the hypothesis, we test the hypothesis, we see what's going along, and maybe one day, you know, we come in and things look like this, and we don't know why. Well, Don will give a talk sometime, uh, it's, I'm not sure when Don's keynote is, but uh, in Don's talk, one of the things that he talks about is that statistically, you know, randomly, as we're pulling things out of here, we're going to get small, medium, and large tasks. And who knows, maybe we just happen to get five really large tasks in a row and, and the verification step is taking longer than normal. Or vice versa, you know, they had two big ones and we just did three small ones and they went through really quickly. So we'll start to learn more about what that means, what that means to our flow, and we'll be able to collaborate on that. 
Okay, I'll get a second half here. And I need another colored pen. So it's not other colored enough. Um, when we're normalizing our assumptions and we're figuring out, you know, uh, now my story is becoming more coordinate with your story, we are creating a shared story. Story, story, story. I'm going to draw it up here. This, this is a story arc, right? So this is the beginning of life for our work, and then it goes through its little life cycle, and then we have resolution over here. Resolution sounds better than death, don't you think? Um, so, but this is every story that's ever been written. No matter what culture, no matter where it came from, every story has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Um, and what we found right from the very beginning is that, so there was a team that we worked with. We started off and they said, well, you know, we're doing really great and everything would be just fine, but we have this crazy team in Bangalore and we have to work with them and they've just been awful. We say, well, what's awful about them? I said, well, you know, they're from Bangalore. I was like, well, you know, there's like actually millions of people from Bangalore, so I'm sure that they're not all bad. Um, and we're shipping billions of work every year to Bangalore, so I'm reasonably sure that someone down there must be doing something competently. And they said, no, 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 they keep doing all these crazy things, and it's all cultural. And I was like, you know, that sounds like a cop-out to me. And they said, well, you know, you'll say that can you do this? And they'll say yes. And then you hang up the phone and then they don't do it. And so, you know, culturally, yes to them means something different than it means to us. Like, well, maybe, but that still sounds really weird. So we set the teams up using a Kanban, and all of a sudden, those problems started to disappear. And they would get on the phone and they'd, 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 they'd be, have, be joking around with each other and they'd be laughing. And they would, you know, and work started to flow. Well, why was that? Well, it was because before, the teams weren't giving each other enough information to act in a coordinated fashion. They weren't collaborating. They were assuming that this team could do things and this team could do things, and they could do things without any information passing between the two of them. The Kanban basically said, you know, look, here's how we do the work, here's the work we're doing, here's how the work is working. Guess what? We've got context. Context creates a story. A story is coherent. When you have a coherent story, you can do a better job. Even if there's a big time zone difference between the two of you, you can do a better job. So now all of a sudden, as this work is flowing across the board, everybody is starting to see the patterns. And the patterns are creating opportunities for collaboration. That's correct. Those are the, these are the super sticky ones. These are the, I don't know, tickets in danger, you might say. So, pull up a couple of ones here. This is one I talk about all the time. Um, so, I'm sitting here, and I'm working away on this ticket, and... Um, Will walks up to the board and Will pulls over this ticket. And I look up and I see that Will's pulled that ticket. And I did something kind of like this yesterday. And I get up and I walk over to Will and I say, hey, if you Google this and this, it'll save you about four hours worth of work. I found all this information already. And Will says, ah, thanks, dude. That was like absolutely no effort on my part. It was almost unnoticeable on Will's part but our team and our organization just saved a half day's worth of work. This is, this is what we do. This is like an autonomic response in humans. I see easy help I can lend. I am going to lend easy help. If I didn't know that Will was working on this, I could not help him work on this. It's just that simple. So being able to see the work and understand what everybody else is doing gives us the ability to spontaneously collaborate. 
And the savings here are ridiculous. They're absolutely ridiculous. So the next bit here is... Um, uh, who, who right now works on an Agile team? And how many people here do stand-ups? And how many of those stand-ups go, yesterday I did this, and today I do, I'm going to do that, and I have no blockers? Ah, good for you. Well, <laughs> almost good for you. So the standard mode of the stand-up meeting is an admission that we don't know what's going on. So if every single day my colleagues have to tell me what, I'm, what they're doing, that only means one thing. I don't know what they're doing. You can't collaborate with people if you don't know what they're doing. So what we want to do now is turn the stand-up meeting into a collaborative planning meeting. So we approach the board again, and there's a bunch of tickets over here, and they're all options, because we've been to see Olaf talk, and we all know these are all options. And we finish this, and this thing's moved over, and et cetera, and so forth. So we say, all right, so today it looks like we're going to be able to move one or two tickets. Um, what's the best utilization of the people that we have on the team today, given what we see here, what we know historically about the movement of these tickets? We know that one of these is going to move, but one of them is probably going to stay. <clears throat> because we know that you know, this shape indicates that the, the verification step is somewhat bogged down. So we say, I think that today we're going to be able to get to two or maybe three things. W given that information, which of these things can move and what groups of people can work on those? How can we collaborate to get these done? Right now, we can only pull one ticket first thing in the morning. So we're going to pull this one even though... Um, because it's going to make the best use of our resources. It's going to make the best use of us. Your stand-up meeting is your opportunity to do daily, uh, kind of a daily collaborative setting. Bloop. All right, so... Now, this one's really quick, so I'm going to put this one up here, too. Um, swarming on problems. So, how many people here are familiar with the Kinevin framework, by any chance? Exactly less than half. Um, so, um, I'm going to give an incredibly short introduction into that just to show you very quickly why this matters. Um, the Kinevin framework is uh, a framework to examine the complexity of things and, and our work. So I'm just going to talk about a couple of domains here really quickly and get out of it. Um, there is a simple domain which is uh, basically I put in a unit of effort, I get out um, um, a unit of product. It's like making toast. Um, so um, we have uh, best practices here. So that's something that works somewhere else and can work for us here. Here we have complicated. And the complicated is where we start to have good practices. And in lean parlance, this is where we start to incur variation in our work, right? So we have enough variation here to make things interesting, but not enough to make them be debilitating. So I can still create stuff, but, but it requires a bit of thought. And then over here is the part that we never think too much about, which is the complex domain, which is where we have emergent practices. And the reason that I'm telling you this is that when we, as software developers or knowledge workers in general, plan for a project, we usually do all of our planning assuming things live in this domain, 
which requires me to basically tell you to do something and then I leave. So make toast, I can tell you make toast, I can leave the room and then I can come back and I'll have some toast. Um, uh, complicated domain is where we live most often, so we need kind of back and forth communication. So that's why we have stand-up meetings every morning is to get on the same page. And then over here in complex, this is where a bunch of our work in software lands, and this is where we always blow our estimates, right? So this is basically, um, I thought I was gonna code this thing pretty easily, and I totally didn't, and now I've been staring at it for six or seven weeks trying to figure out what the hell's going on. So, I will diagram this another way really, well, I'll do this really quick. So when we end up in this situation, we can do this work on our own and there's absolutely no problem. When we're in this situation, we can do our work, but our work is a little bit more complicated and we need to coordinate with others. When we do this, we can't solve these problems by ourselves. These are really complex problems. They have multiple input, potential inputs, multiple potential outputs, and we have to run series of experiments to figure out exactly which one we're in, and then after we settle on one, then it becomes a complicated problem because we've now gained the expertise in order to train it. Does that, does that make sense? Um, usually a Kinevin training takes, I don't know, six to eight months and heavy drugs. So um, this, is, uh, this is definitely a short form. But the reason I'm telling you this is because over here, Let's say that um, our work currently looks like this, and uh, I have been working on this for, um, for one day, and uh, Will's been working on this for a million days, and Tony Ann's been working on this for one day. The appropriate response for Tony Ann and me is to go over and say, Will, I think, I think this is a complex problem. I think we need to work on it. Because there's no difference in the skill sets between the three of us. We're all perfectly competent and moving work normally. But from time to time, we'll find ourselves in this situation. And this is what normally happens with a situation like that. What normally happens in a situation like this when we're not visualizing our work and we don't have a whip limit, is that we'll start this task and we'll say, I can't quite figure this one out. And then at the end of the sprint or at the end of the deadline, we'll start pulling all of these tickets out and we'll try and do them all at the very end. So what we want to do is recognize using the board, using dwell time or other things, um, when we've hit a complex problem and then collaboratively uh, work to, to finish that. And I'm gonna skip that one. So this topic, corner here, this topic one here says seeing around corners. Uh, the, um, the subtitle for it is collaboration isn't huggy shit. So um, I, I want to make sure that we don't think that collaboration is this, you know, fluffy bunny thing that we're all getting together and saying, oh, I sure love you, let's just collaborate and everything will be fine. Um, uh, collaboration is actually quite necessary, and if we don't do it, we're going to constantly fall prey to these, and our assumptions about these aren't going to be validated by talking to our peers. And so we're going to be building features based on our assumptions and not actually based on their, on their real needs. So, so how can we, let's say that we've got this problem. Let's say that, let's say we've got this problem. We'll call it, we'll call it the will problem. So I've got the, the will problem here. And we've got to fix it. What are, some, what are some ways that we can use Kanban to attack this problem? And um, are any of you familiar with our lean coffee concept? Stop raising your hand. <laughs> I'm just going to assume you're going to raise your hand. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> that's all he's got to do. Um, so um, several years ago, 
uh, a friend of mine and I were having coffee in, in Seattle, and we realized that, that Seattle had become kind of a nexus for uh, all of this lean stuff. And so we wanted to start a lean Seattle group. And I, I didn't want to start another professional organization. You know, I didn't want you know, to have people have to sponsor us, and I didn't want to have to find um, uh, speakers, and I didn't want to have to find a location. You know, it just seemed like a lot of work, and uh, I'd done it a million times, and it was always thankless or felt thankless. So I said, why don't we just get people together once a week to have coffee, and we'll talk about this stuff, and we'll form a community of practice. And, but we realized that if we just had people come for coffee and talk informally, that an organization wouldn't form out of that because it would be disorganized. And in personal Kanban, we only have two rules, which are limit your work in progress and visualize your work. That's also our two rules for Kanban in general. And we like to have the minimal amount of structure necessary to make something happen. So we said, what could be the minimal amount of structure that would cause a professional society to form? So we said, well, we'll have people show up, we'll have a regular location, and we'll have a regular format, and the format will be the glue to hold everybody together. So the format looked something like this. We put up a personal Kanban, which looked something like this. And, um, you know, a little whip limit there. And then we, surprisingly, gave everybody post-it notes. So everybody had post-it notes. They wrote down whatever they wanted to talk about on the post-it notes. Filled all that in. Gave brief introductions for what was on the post-it notes. And then we voted on what we wanted to talk about. So people would dot vote. And then you talk about them in priority, order. So pull that over, start talking about it. A couple of things about this. One is that when you do this, you are taking an agendaless meeting and instantly giving it form and substance. The second thing that you're doing when you do this is you are creating a shared focus. So the people who come to the meeting are the people who set the parameters and the, and the, and the, um, the um, substance of the meeting. When we are solving this problem that we're swarming on, one of the reasons why we want to do these things in private first, so take our things and say, okay, we've got this problem here, what are some ways that we can solve it, or what are some issues that we think are causing it, or what do we think we should discuss? We write down what those are, and we do that like this, not looking at our peers, because we're going to have ample opportunity in a second to discuss these things anyway. But if we don't do this, we fall prey to something that Dave Snowden calls premature convergence, where somebody in the group will say, I think we should do this, and everybody thinks, is that plausible? Yeah, that's plausible, that's likely, let's, let's go ahead and try that. But then they stop thinking about other possible solutions. So what we found when we go work with clients is on the second day of our, uh, second, third, and fourth, and fifth days of our events there, we will do lean coffee every morning. And when we arrive, everybody says, our problems are, and they will list them. They'll say our problems are A and B, and A and B, A and B. Everybody agrees in the whole world that this company's problem is A and B. But when we get into lean coffee, everybody will come in and they'll put A and B, but then we'll put a whole bunch more tickets in, and somewhere around here, around N, somebody throws in a random thought, and that becomes this ticket. Everybody looks at it and realizes, you know, oh my God, this is the root cause, or potentially the root cause of A and B. This is the thing we really should be working on and not these two things. So these things were the visible problems. These were the things that everybody was bitching about, but this was actually the real problem. So using the lean coffee format to hold a meeting 
does several things. The first thing is just if right now if I'm going to have a meeting in, in the normal world, what every book tells me is that I have to send out a very detailed agenda, right? So I will say, I, Jim Benson, am calling a meeting, and here's the people that I demand come to my meeting, and then I'm going to give a 10-minute introduction, and then for that, after that, we're going to spend five minutes exactly talking about all of these things, and then when we're done, we're going to come up with these things. So what have I just done? I've just created a plan. I've done exactly what we tell ourselves not to do every single time when we set up software projects. So I have created a plan based on my assumptions of what the problem was, my assumptions of who needed to come, my assumptions of what needed to be discussed. And then when people get that, they go through what psychologists call reactants. Because what I've just sent them is a legal document. And they've, it basically says, you know, notice herewith that the heretofore named people will, shall appear and shall act in the accordant ways and discuss only these things. When I get that and go through reactants, reactants has two steps. The first step is, what's the least amount I can do to conform to these rules that Jim has given me? And the second is, how can I undermine these rules that Jim has given me? So I get these and I look at it and I say, aha, Jim says we're going to talk about these things, but those aren't really the things I wanted to talk about. So where can I insert my agenda into Jim's agenda when I get there? But when we do this, the group gets together, the group creates the agenda, there's no one to fight against. And you get a really good indication, if this was the thing that I was going to insert into somebody else's agenda, and no one votes for it, that's a really good indication that I was the only person who really thought this was worth talking about. But otherwise, I would just insert it because my assumption is that everybody wants to talk about what I want to talk about. So when we have a collaborative meeting, we set up a collaborative agenda, and then we start discussing things in this priority order, that allows us, as we go through the system, or through the meeting, to talk about the things of highest priority, come to the conclusions of highest priority, and move on. Does that make sense? All right, we already grabbed that one. So, I'm actually going to skip those and go straight to this one because this one's fun. So one of the things, when I've been talking about collaboration lately, um, there's been a series of articles against collaboration. People say, you know, collaboration is for extroverts, and a lot of us are introverts, and so we don't like to collaborate. Um, I would say that Depending on the situation, people oscillate between being an extrovert and an introvert, depending on how they're feeling at the time, how comfortable they are, what their knowledge is, you know, how amped up they are. Yes, there are people who are naturally classifiable as uh, extroverts. Does that mean two minutes? Okay. <laughs> when, when is the coffee break? It's on now. Seriously? Holy crap. <laughs> All right, okay, I will get through this thought and uh, then we will, and we'll do the copyright. Um, so, um, at, at one of my clients in the States, um, there's a guy named Larry. And uh, Larry is completely awesome. Uh, he's an amazing coder. Uh, he likes to blow things up. He's a pyrotechnician. He's actually pretty fascinating to talk to. Uh, total, total introvert. And so when we first started down the path of, of shared work, he was absolutely terrified. 
He's like, I don't like talking to people. I don't like telling other people what to do. I don't like imposing myself. I don't like this. I don't like that. And what's been interesting to watch is over the last two, uh, two and a half years or so, how he has become the natural leader for the group because the definition that a lot of people who are scared of collaboration have is that collaboration is constantly working, sitting right next to somebody and having them watch you while you work. But there aren't. There are many different forms of collaboration. Um, and there's a difference between collaboration and coordination. And so Larry had some really amazing insights as he was moving through those. And I will share them with you after the coffee break. So, woo, that's so much louder. Um, welcome back, everybody. So just, just out of interest, how many of you came back specifically because I teased you with Larry? <laughs> so um, when I, um, oh, he just left. Um, so the, the bald guy running around here, um, who's not the other bald guy who's running around here, that one. Um, <laughs> you're too late. Uh, this guy is actually Larry's uh, boss. Um, and he um, asked Larry, um, it's, uh, he, asked, he asked all of his people initially, you know, would you, um, um, would you please read? And they said, what? I said, I would like you to read. And they're like, read what? And he's like, books. And so they said, well, can you recommend books? And he said, well, I'd rather not. I'd rather just have you read. And they said, no, I really want you to recommend us some books. So I said, okay. So he, rec he recommends a bunch of books. And you can correct me if I'm telling this story wrong, Jabe. So several months go by, and he basically at one point says, did anybody read any of those books? And they said, no. I said, why not? I said, well, we don't have enough time at work to read. Or, we don't, we, you know, when we go home, we don't want to read. And Jabe says, no, I, I want you to read at work. And they're like, won't you fire us if we read at work? He said, no, I'll fire you if you read at work. You, you need to read. And they said, but we're too busy. We can't possibly have enough time to, time to read. Um, but, but Larry was one of the people who actually did take to reading. And because of that, all of a sudden, when Jabe would bring things up, Larry started to become the only person who knew what Jabe was talking about. Because Jabe was talking about all these concepts that were completely alien to everybody else. And that meant that people started asking Larry questions. And as time went on, Larry began to evolve more and more into an information source, which he actually did feel comfortable with, even, even being an introvert. And what was cool about that is that the natural tendency of a company is to say, aha, people are gravitating towards this guy. He should be a manager, right? And so you start turning a, your best developers into managers, which they're not set up to be, and B, probably forcing people who are less comfortable going to other people with information into managers. And so even though that would be putting Larry into a more collaborative situation, it would be putting him into a situation that he was fundamentally not comfortable with, which is anti-collaborative. So saying that collaboration is only about you know, being gregarious and working with other people is actually kind of a fallacy. So what collaboration actually means to me is that we as a group have common goals and we are setting up a system to achieve those goals, right? Does that make sense? Larry is now able to collaborate with his team because he has a Kanban which facilitates the communication of that collaboration. 
and allows him to have evidence whenever he's talking about something. So he says, you know, I think that we're having this problem. He now no longer has to build a long internal argument and then have to go to battle with other people. He can say, the Kanban now clearly shows that we have this bottleneck here. I believe it's being caused by these things. Let's collaborate on finding a solution for fixing that right now. Let's have a conversation and fix that. Um, when we first started showing up, uh, this gentleman was, um, would sit in the back corner of the room. Uh, he wouldn't talk very much. Now when we show up, he talks quite a bit. Um, and he will actually seek, he seeks us out all the time to have specific conversations about things that he's learned or things that uh, the team is doing. Uh, and it's because I'm convinced that he has a comfort level with the information and he has a comfort level with the exchange that we are going to have. So excluding people from collaboration because they are identified either by themselves or by others. Hey, that's me. Um, thank you, Jabe. Um, because we've identified these people as uh, introverts, means that we are going to have some serious problems as software developers collaborating. I'll quickly show you why. Um, I have a diagram that I usually draw to depict something else. Now that's my, that's my diagram. Um, but I'm going to use it today for people on a scale from introverts to extroverts. And all the way at the end is probably somebody who is debilitatingly introverted and someone who can never, ever, ever, ever shut up. Um, what I tell people is that uh, software development in particular, the thing that really makes it difficult is that it is all-encompassing. So we deal with language, we deal with uh, aesthetics, we deal with mathematics, we deal with um, uh, metrics, you know, uh, you know we, have, we have math, we have beauty, we have charm, we have, you know, geekdom, we have everything in between. And so it's, it's a really special field. And so really special people end up being in this field. And so if we have a team of software developers, you know, they might look something like that. They might be all over the spectrum. And so we can't just say, you know, from this side on over, we're going to, to collaborate. Now, let's uh, go back to the board here. Um, let's say that our board, we come in one day and our board looks like this. We know, pretty apparently, that the system is broken down and that there is a backup here. Okay. If our board looked like this because we didn't have a board, what do we know? We as developers know that we wrote some software and it kicked ass and then it went to testing and it died. That's what we know. And what do we know about why it died? We know, well, I know it kicked ass when it left here. So they must be lazy, good for nothing, rotten bastards, and I hate them. And then we would go over and we would start yelling at them and we would say, you know, you tester, you know, say the tester's name is, you know, Gary. Gary, you totally suck. You're a lousy tester. I gave you all this work. You weren't able to test it. What is wrong with you? And that's what psychologists call fundamental attribution error, right? We blame the, last pers the person who last had something with the failure of that something. A very anti-collaborative pattern. Here, 
we have visualized a breakdown in the system, but it's the system. It's not the people. So we look at this and we say, there seems to be a problem with the system. So before, a person who didn't feel comfortable challenging other people with no visualization whatsoever would ignore the problem or would keep their heads down and say, I'm just doing my work and somebody else can work on that other thing. When we visualize this together, we now own, we share ownership of the whole board. Before our goal was to do our work, we were given a user story, we type our way through it, hand it on. Now, our goal is to get something from here to here in such a way that it doesn't come back. So basically, if we have a, a user story or a feature or whatever, we want it to go through all of these steps, and then when it gets over here, we want it to be of sufficient quality so that it doesn't come back. Regardless of whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, whether you're ADHD or Asperger, regardless of whether you're colorblind or have full color spectrum vision, uh, regardless of whether you're from India or from New York, anyone on earth is going to see that this is greater than the number three. And anybody on earth is going to see that there's a backup here and that something needs to be done and yelling isn't an option. So getting together and saying collaboratively, now that we've, now that we've visualized this bottleneck, how do we as a team start to get this stuff out of here quickly but not irresponsibly? So again, when it gets over here to ship, we don't want this to be rife with escape defects. We want this to ship because it was really done. We don't want it to ship because somebody told me arbitrarily it's the end of our two week sprint and we have to ship it. Or I'll get yelled at if I don't ship it. We want it to get over here so the group can actually work on that and they can say we've got this. First of all, how do we adjudicate it? How do we get rid of it? And then secondly, how do we stop it from ever happening again? So we'll talk about that in a slightly different form. So let's say our board looks like this. It's a nice, healthy board. And uh, I have a cold, so I can't mimic David. I was going to give, give you a really awesome David Anderson impression, but I can't. Um, because Scottish hurts your throat. <laughs> um, so let's say that you're sitting here working away, and then all of a sudden you get this expedite ticket. You know, our, our servers are down and we're not, we're not selling any, uh, any books. Uh, what are we supposed to do? Well, we can't say, well, you know, I'm working on this ticket that needs to be done in six months. We have to say, okay, you know, you know put that in and blow, blow my whip, you know, all the hell. And then that goes through here and it expedites its way through and like maybe by the end of the day it's done. This ticket is a call for an automatic retrospective, automatic and immediate. We don't wait two weeks, we don't wait a month, we don't wait six months, or however long you normally do retrospectives. This thing hurt you by making this number greater than three. It slowed down your normal production, and you want to know why, okay? So you would want to have some sort of a collaborative meeting, some sort of a retrospective to immediately note why this is. And one of the things here is that, um, uh, how many people have had a product project go by that nothing ever went wrong in the whole project? The ones that I can't <laughs> except, except, uh, except Pavel. Um, <laughs> 
things go wrong in almost every project, and so we tend to do this when anything goes wrong. We say, well, you know, I would have had this done in the three days that I promised you, but it snowed. I would have had this done in the three days, but somebody on my team got sick. I would have, and there's a but, and then the but is followed by an excuse, and the excuse is treated as an anomaly, and then no one ever tries to figure out a way around that in the future. And sometimes those anomalies are part of our normal variation, but often those anomalies are things that if we, even if we can't stop them, we can talk about ways to mitigate their impact. So when David talks about the higher degrees of risk as we enter greater unknowns, a lot of those risks that David's talking about are simply the discovery process in knowing what those unknowns are. But a lot of those risks are risks that we take on foolishly every time because, as, as David was saying earlier, we're still planning to the, for the 5 to 15% of our time that's actually active on the project, and we're not compensating for all of the waste from waiting. So when we look at a team that's doing Kanban and we see that their productivity rise is something like that, it's not because we made them better coders, because they were already awesome coders. It's because here, you're just removing the things that was stopping them from being an awesome coder. And you guys can ask questions at any, any time as well. So I'm going to jump a little bit into the cognitive bias world here, even though I've already been in that a bit. So the ticket here says debugging bias. And so the first thing I'll do is I'll start off by saying that even if we understand that we have a cognitive bias or that we suffer from all 138 of them that are on uh, the list of cognitive biases on Wikipedia, um, so yes, you are all right now suffering from at least 138 cognitive biases. You are all flawed. It's a wonder that you got here today. Um, <clears throat> so we can't actually stop the cognitive biases from happening, but what we can do is put systems in place to warn us that we are suffering from one or more of them. Um, and one of the things here is I have uh, healthy skepticism and institutionalized skepticism. So uh, one of the other things that we've done at, at the Library Corporation and, and in other places is we've instilled systems that specifically ask people to constantly believe that what they're doing is wrong. <laughs> so when I say that you know, this value stream that we've got here is going to migrate over time to something else, when David says that a majority often of the tickets that are currently or that start off our project in, in our um, a, a alleged um, set of options or backlog or whatever we want to call it, are going to fall by the wayside, that we're going to discard them. If we believe what um, most of the Agile texts are, which says that 80% of all features at the beginning of a software project migrate by the time you get to the end of a software project, we have to remain skeptical at all times that what we're building is actually the right thing. Skepticism is an internal thing for us. So we keep saying, that's my assumption, that's my assumption, that's my assumption. And it is an institutionalizable thing for our teams. So when People set up their team Kanban, and then down here they might have a box of policies that they've made explicit about you know, why something enters this column, why something leads this column, what we do when something's blocked, what we do when something is taking too much time, what we do when something is complex. 
these policies are just as questionable as anything else that we're doing. So when we go through a retrospective, we tend to ask foolish questions like what went right and what went wrong, usually to a whole bunch of people who have absolutely no memory of what just happened to them. The only thing that they're going to remember are the peaks, right? So they're going to remember, this sucked horribly and this was the best day ever. I sure, and so let's talk entirely about the this sucked horribly. Well, the this sucked horribly may have been, you know, a load balancer going down or uh, the power going out or something that really probably isn't going to happen again. But in the middle there is a whole bunch of daily annoyances that you can totally get rid of. So one of the other things that we get out of this is these. This is the written record of what just happened. For real. Not, the, not how we remember it. So there's another cognitive bias that's called rosy retrospective syndrome. No, I didn't make it up. It's really called rosy retrospective syndrome. And rosy retrospective syndrome says, you tend to remember things better than they actually were. So I'm not gonna, don't, don't go to childhood right away for that, just, it's, it's okay. But, um, but we tend to remember, so, so we kind of go through kind of like this Nietzschean moment where we say, you know, that which does not kill me makes me stronger. So if something really lousy happens during a project for a couple of weeks, you'll be really ma mad about it. But if you let it go on beyond that, you'll start to forget how mad you were. And you'll forget how much of a, of a thing it uh, was because you're like, well, I, we lived through it. It must have been okay. So... What we do is we ask our teams to note um, on each individual ticket um, something that psychologists call subjective well-being, and you guys might call emoticons. But you note on the tickets themselves, to any granularity that you wish, how you felt when you finished that task. And what we're doing here is we're building a leading indicator for quality problems. Because when we go to work and we're typing away and we're, we're knowledge workers, this is, this is the tool that we use. It's the, the wetware between the, our ears. We can spend thousands and thousands of dollars a year on new laptops and phones and whatnot. But if you unplug our brains, we're not going to be typing very much. And if we go to work and we look like this, we write lousy code. Right? Prisoners make lousy coders. So when I come in as a manager, if all I see, if I come in, I see three or four of these have built up, you know, in the, say here in the, in the done column, I come in and there are three of these tickets and all of them, all of them look angry. I know that my job right then is to make everybody stop working, gather them together and say, what, what? And these, these, you know, these don't happen because, because a football match goes the wrong way. The, these don't happen because it's been rainy for 35 days straight. These happen usually because professionals are upset because they are not satisfied with the quality of the work that they're doing. So imagine this for a second. I come in and I see this board as a manager, and I go to everybody and I say, what's up? And they say, well, you know, uh, we've had a real hard time today uh, with um, uh, you know, checking in our code. It's just really been a really hard day checking our code. Like, okay, let's, um, let's, uh, let's, this shouldn't be here. <laughs> uh, let's, um, 
really quickly. Let's assume that these aren't done. You guys go have a beer. Come back tomorrow. Uh, and we will do two things. One, we will start the day by figuring out what's going on with the repository that's making the code hard to check in. Then after that, we're going to do a quick code review on what you guys just wrote today. I defy anybody in the world to give a coder code and uh, have them not refactor it in some way. So they tighten up their code in whatever little ways until they can turn these things into smileys. And um, w by the time it gets over here into verification and testing, I guarantee you that the quality of this code has now increased significantly. Did we lose a day of production? Not really. Because if we would have let those angry faces go through, I guarantee we would have lost a lot more time because everybody would have been refactoring well after this thing wasn't fresh in their minds anymore. This is another kind of collaboration. This is the group mind, uh, as I was talking to Will a couple seconds ago, I'll use, use the word, this is a symbolic reputation, re representation of the thoughts that are going through the group mind. Yes? Ah, so the question was, uh, what would I do if the source of the problem, if the source of those angry faces was outside the team? Um, and I reserve the right to answer the question as vague as it was presented. <laughs> So, um, there are an infinite number of ways that they could be upset of, of things that were happening outside the team. They could be uh, outside political events that were upsetting the team. It could be a technical uh, event. It could be an imposition of an unfair deadline. Uh, it could be um, personality conflicts between one team and another team. It could be enforced selection of technology. You know, the, the list could just go on as long as my arm. So um, there's, I'm trying to come up with a, a quick and glib way to answer that. Um, there's two ways to change that angry face to a happy face. One is to give people the ability to create the code in the manner that makes them the most comfortable, which is the one I described. In the event that they do not have the capability of controlling their environment to that extent, the other way to make these happy faces is to have everybody share that pain. So everybody gets together and they say, our CTO is an idiot, yes! And then they go off and they all code together because now they have that same, sh that, you know, we have, we have established, you know, that, that, uh, that there is a malevolent force outside that's forcing us to do these things. So there's, because there's, there's another part of this. When you start, you know, you know let's say one of these tasks is, is, you know, back up the database. Like, completely boring, pointless task that, you know, you, you, you don't want to do. Um, those will get angry faces at the beginning until people get used to the flow of the work. And then after, so initially what will happen is you'll see all of these tasks that need to be done, and then the boring ones will end up never being pulled. But then after a while, people re recognize in order for us to achieve the flow that we want, every so often I personally have to pull something that I'm not happy with. So what will be interesting is you'll see a migration of the reasons for putting those angry faces on there, and you have those conversations, and then you, you, you adapt. 
Um, now, ultimately, you, you know, the team, the team that's angry with outside, uh, outside influence will need to deal with outside influence, but they probably don't have the political capability to, to stop work altogether until they deal with a political issue. Does that work? Um, so, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the planning fallacy. And the reason I talk a lot about this particular cognitive bias is because it's kind of like a container for all of the other cognitive biases. <laughs> it's like every other cognitive bias, you add them all together, they would be called the planning fallacy. And the planning fallacy basically has a very simple statement wrapped around it, and it is this. Uh, we suck at planning. And um, the, the ultimate statement of it is in something called Hofstetter's Law, which says that human beings will naturally underestimate any task even if they're aware of Hofstetter's Law. And given what we heard from David this morning and what I've talked about so far, we can see right away that there are a lot of forces that would cause us to naturally underestimate our work. So we think of our work as the active time that we're working, but we don't think of it in terms of the delays. And the delays are sometimes predictable, they're sometimes unpredictable. Um, we have for years run on a story point model, which thankfully we're starting to move away from. We'll use this one. But, um, I had a team, I was working with them, and I said, you know, I would like you to start looking at, at, the, the, your, at your cycle time, and I would like you to stop looking at, at um, your story points. And they said, but you know, we've almost got story points perfect. We don't, we don't want to stop, we've almost got them perfect. I was like, well, that's awesome, you know, then we probably shouldn't switch. You know, can you show me, you know, how you've almost got them perfect? And they got really excited, they said, yes, because we've graphed it all out. I said, okay, they said, so, okay. So they show me these graphs, and like, here's, you know, one story point, and the time to complete kind of looks like this, and three story points kind of looks like this, and, you know, five kind of looks like this. And they say, if we could just get rid of these, we'd be perfect. <laughs> I was like, yeah, you sure would. <laughs> You're cute. So um, the, these guys... Um, I weren't noticing that these were all the same distribution. They're all Pareto curves. And what was happening was this is a totally valid one point story, and this is a totally valid one point story, this is a totally valid three point story, this is a totally valid three point story, this is a totally valid five, and this is a totally valid five. Why are they all valid? Well, they're valid because the, the distributions are the same. You know, if you had, you know, if you had seven, and it looked like that, you know, then you know that would not. Then it would break the trend. But this is obviously whatever they're doing, they are doing consistently. And this difference here is the graphical representation of the variation that they, were, uh, that they were coming up against. So as professionals, they were all saying, you know, this is a one, 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 one. But if they would have, if they would have done these in random order, they would have had the same distribution. <laughs> um, so here, this is this, or this. Or this. Um, this is money. This orange thing is money. So if we calm ourselves so that we're able to predict our work perfectly, then we have no variation, then we have no value add, then we all make, you know, 10 euros an hour. We've commodified software development. So... Yes. 
I'm sorry? Yes. 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 So, uh, um, so what was frustrating about that, the question was, did I read Daniel Kahneman's fat Thinking Fast and Slow? And I highly recommend Thinking Fast and Slow to everyone who wants to read a book. I will warn you that it's this thick. Yes, it is, it is, it is so big that it makes your Kindle heavy. Um, but um, it was funny because he came out with his book two days before we released this. It really pissed me off. Um, <laughs> but um, Daniel Kahneman was part of the team of Kahneman and Tversky, and they are the, basically the, the guys who came up with all of these, well, with the basis of cognitive bias. Tremendously wonderful people, great thinkers, uh, really deep. Um, and um, really quickly, I'll get through the planning fallacy, and then we'll see if we can get through a couple questions. Um, but um, as a team, when we approach our work, as David was getting at this morning, he was saying, you know, we can do things in a quantitative way, or we can do things in a qualitative way, and software development works fast enough the qualitative is actually preferable to quantitative because the time it takes to come up with numbers that are meaningful are, is very difficult. And the numbers that are going to come up become, be de derived by any analyst represent fully all of the cognitive biases of that analyst. So, when I go into multinational corporations and I say, I want you to manage your software development with smileys, they say, smileys and what? <laughs> and I say, smileys and, and more smileys. Um, when we are collaborating on our work in real time, let's go back to the Kanban here really quick. When we're collaborating on our work in real time, and we have this, this wonderful, increasingly messy Kanban, um, and we're watching work flow through it, we are going through pattern matching exercises. This work item type tends to flow at this rate. That work item type tends to flow at that work item, at that rate. Um, Something seems wrong to me. I wonder what it could be. Um, this is actually how we naturally approach the world. And the mathematics of reductionist management are how we wish the world worked. So when we're looking here and we see all of these options coming up, are available to us, I guess I should say. And we get a little bit of capacity here so we can do a little bit of work. And we look over here to pull next. Do we want to, result, to rely on heavy pre-planning and a Gantt chart, or do we want to rely on a collaborative conversation? That's right. <laughs> Damn right. And so that's why I tell everybody that they need to put little tiny Gantt charts on all of their... Um, and remember, if you, just, if you just line these up like a Gantt chart, then you would have what we call a false sense of security, um, which is what management has been based on for the last 50 years. Uh, the difference is, and I talked about this a little bit in, um, in, in Austria, is that business used to move really slowly because the cost of information transfer was extremely high, but now the cost of information transfer is almost zero. The ability to truly self-organize a team is at, is at its easiest ever. There's a lot of problems right now because we're also all very distracted, and so that's kind of leveling things out a little bit maybe. But we used to be able to do these slow things because 
we really had lots of, lots of time in those gaps between actual active periods. Now we're shrinking those through lean, through advances in, in communications technology, through changes in management techniques and so forth. So now we don't have the luxury anymore of saying, you know, I'm going to do this and then in two weeks I'm going to do that because our options every minute for things that we can do are completely maxed out. Everyone on Earth right now is completely maxed out, or at least everyone on Earth with access to the Internet. The Internet's a horrible thing. We should get rid of it right away. Um, so, um, obviously, I had a bit more here to do, and David had me add a couple other things in his talk. He inspired me a bit, but I'm not going to tell you about them. <laughs> um, uh, I didn't get to silos either. That makes me sad. Um, but So we have uh, three minutes and 45 seconds, which I think leaves us time for about a dozen questions. Um, so uh, are there any questions um, at this time? <laughs> okay, so um, so let's let's diagram that out. Um, okay, so let's see. Teams that do not give a shit. How do you how do you make a team that doesn't give a shit begin to shit? So um, this is a completely scatological ending to my talk. So. I'll answer, that one of t I'll answer that two ways. Okay, the first way might be some teams are damaged enough that they may never actually care. In which case, I don't care about them either. So that's, that's a nice two-way street. Uh, so somebody does have to start caring at some point. Uh, I'm happy to lead with the caring card, but if it's not reciprocated, then it's, it's simply not reciprocated. Uh, but teams that, teams that absolutely don't care, are probably never actually going to produce good, good output uh, anyway. But the question is, why when you enter a, situ a system does the team actively not care? And what we found is a, a couple of things have happened. Um, so I talked about the, the, where the teams were fighting between locations. In that way, they were in an, an uncaring position. Um, but there was... Um, an early project uh, that David and I and Corey had um, uh, when we first started MODIS, um, where we went in and, and I'm not kidding, it was like this long classroom and these people, this, this company had sent a bunch of their people to, to uh, training and everybody sat right up front except for these two guys who sat way in back. And they made angry noises. Mm. Ah. And they were pretty much marginalized from the rest of the group. So this group was split between New York and Los Angeles, so we were flying back and forth, and no matter where we were, these guys never talked to anybody else. They were always off in another part of the room. And uh, when we finally asked, like, what's going on? They said, you know, oh, those guys, you know, they do their stuff, but they're curmudgeons. They're angry all the time. We just don't like them. But then when we got past the training phase and actually started working with the board, there was this weird shift where they went from the back of the room, just making sure I don't kill myself here, and, and then they kind of, kind of moved up a little bit, and they kind of moved over here, and then maybe somebody up in the front turned around and said, uh, is that what you guys were talking about? And then all of a sudden it became clear that what was happening was these guys that, that were angry and no longer gave a shit, um, they, in the beginning, were the people who kept saying, I think that we could have better process if we did this. I'm seeing these issues here. I'm seeing this issues, these issues there. And they had no visual representation of their arguments. So they became increasingly disenfranchised. And as that happened, they removed themselves from the group. So by giving the team, which whether they liked it or not included them, 
they were able to actually have a depersonalized argument or, you know, visualized argument for all of the arguments that they had been making throughout the years. So this is one of the, one of the huge things is that people who, people who start to shut down in companies and say, just, just tell me what to do, there's two reasons that they do that. One, because they don't know what to do. And two, because when they try to do something on their own, they get shot down. And so when we visualize what they're doing, then they can point to the board and say, here is my logic tree. I am doing this because I see this coming up and I see these becoming a chain of value. I am doing this because that stakeholder asked me for it. I think it's of value. If you don't, you need to tell me and I can do something else. But if we don't have the visualization, then we never have those conversations and everything stays a personal argument. Everything that we say we don't want to do, we're complaining about. If I say I don't want to do something, I am lazy because I have no proof that me not wanting to do something will have a beneficial effect somewhere else. And uh, Olaf here has just beheaded me. <laughs> so, so thank you all very much uh, for sitting and putting up with me for two solid hours. This is a long one. Uh, thank you.